Hey, we are in week four of a series titled Things Jesus Never Said. And so if you haven't been following along with us, if you haven't been here through any of these, I encourage you to go back, go to, go to our website, or you can go to our YouTube page and watch the messages and sort of catch up so that you can uh, hear some of the other things that Jesus never said. But to, to catch you up for those who, uh, who haven't been here, let me just sort of recap where we've been. Week one, we sort of did an intro to the whole thing. And we, uh, we basically brought it to this point. The devil comes to do two things, to thieve and deceive. And what we learned is, is our way to combat his tactics. So what he wants to do is he's not going to come in and he's not going to tell you a lie that is so far from the truth that it's obvious. What he's going to do is he's going to come in, he's going to tell you a lie that's very, very close to the truth, just a very slight deviation. And then, after, and then what happens is, is over the course of time, the longer we stay on that path, the further away we get from the truth, and then we ultimately end up in places in life that we never, ever wanted to be. And so what we said is, the thief comes to, he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what Jesus said. And then what we said about that is, he is here to deceive and thieve, and his word is our weapon. How do we know what's right? Well, how we know what's right is digging into God's word and letting God's word reveal the truth to us. Week two, uh, the thing that we said that, Jesus never said is that church isn't important. I want you to go back and watch that if, if you haven't had an opportunity to hear it. And it's basically this, that, you know, we, we live in a world today that's so fast-paced and it's so crazy and, you know, we get pulled in 20 different directions and there's a temptation for all of us to go, I'm exhausted, I'm tired. You know what? I, I can worship anywhere. And so church isn't that important. And what we sort of unpacked in that is that Jesus didn't didn't die for us to be separated. He died for us to be united in faith, united in the blood of Christ, that we are called to be the church and that we can't do it without each other. If we, can't, couldn't do, if we could do it without each other, then Jesus wouldn't have said he would build his church. So uh, that's an encouragement to you. I hope uh, it's helpful. And then week three, uh, Jesus never said, this was last week, Jesus never said, all you need is belief. Because again, I mean, if, it, if all it was was believing, then why would James come behind that and say, um, you believe in God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. The devil believes in God, and he believes in God's power more than even we do, okay? He knows better. So it's not just about belief. Jesus didn't say, believe in me. He said, follow me. So again, encourage you to go back and listen to that if you haven't had an opportunity. So to, to dive into or to introduce today's um, message, I, first what I want to do is pray that God would help us to understand fully uh, what he's trying to teach us, and then, um, and then we'll... we'll We'll talk about it just a little bit. Let's pray together. God, we want to say how thankful we are for today. And God, it's Mother's Day. It is the opening, the reopening of our sanctuary that has been newly renovated. Uh, God, it is, it is a day of baptisms. God, it's just a, it's a day of new life in so many ways. And God, we've celebrated new life through baby dedication. We've celebrated life, new life through a baptism. And God, there's a new life uh, for a building anyway, and God, we are excited about the new life that will come as a result of this building being here um, and for, for decades and generations to come. So God, as we dive into your word today, God, help us to understand fully what you want to teach us. God, we pray that you challenge us at the very core of our soul to know what it is that you would have us to do, not to just to know, but what you would have us to do with what you're going to teach us today. Lord, we love you, we trust you, and Jesus Pray, Amen. Uh, I want to I want to go back to for those of you who can remember that far back, the mid two thousands. Uh, there was a commercial that came out. There was a series of commercials ran for several years. Uh, a, a company uh, named Staples ran these, and I don't know if you remember it, but but they had this uh, they had this thing. So like, if you were having a problem in the commercial, there would be some kind of problem that would be impossible to solve. And they had this thing called an easy button. How many of you remember the easy button? How many of you owned an easy button? Like y'all went out and bought one of those things. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. And, and you probably wore it out and it just like wouldn't work sometimes, right? And here's, and if you didn't see the commercials or you don't remember the commercials, what would happen is if you had a problem, 
you would just press the button and your problems would be instantaneously fixed and repaired and, and everything would work out just the way you wanted them. So if you couldn't figure out, like there was a kid in math class and he couldn't figure out the problem, like the teacher turns around and says, Johnny, what's the answer? And he's like, uh, and he hits the easy button and there's the answer. I mean, how many of you would have loved that when you were in math class? Amen to that. Uh, there, there was another one where um, like the kids are at home and dad's trying to change the diapers and you can tell it's like dad's maybe first or second time changing the diapers and it wasn't just one baby, it was like twins. And so he's like, I, I, don't, I don't even know what to do right here. So he pushes the easy button. I mean, just makes it simple. Or there was another one where there's a guy just having a hard time at work. He, he couldn't figure something out. So, you know, he just pushed the easy button. And there was, one, there was one commercial where actually the guy comes into his job and he's, he looks just lost. And his coworker says, hey, are you okay? What's going on? And he says, I can't just find my easy button. And she was like, oh, well, you can just borrow mine. So she used, he used her easy button to find his easy button. I mean, sort of a, you know, kind of nightmarish type uh, thing where you're trying to follow all these trains of thoughts. But there was, um, that was the commercial. That was the slogan. The slogan of the campaign posed the question, don't you wish there was an easy button for life? And Staples said, uh, now, now you have one for your business. That was their push. Now, don't we wish like there was an easy button for life? Don't you wish that there were just times in life when difficulties came your way that you could just push the button and everything would be made right just like you wanted it? We all know that that's not how it works. And uh, to, to help us in set up and understand fully what Jesus did say, the thing that we're going to talk about today that Jesus never said is Jesus never said life will be easy. Now, there's a lot of people that, as, as strange as this may sound, there's a lot of people that believe that way. That, hey, you know what? And all you got to do is commit your life to Jesus, and once you, once you surrender your life to Jesus and you're saved, life, you're, the rest of your life is just, just going to be a piece of cake. It's going to be easy. Everything from here on out is just all downhill. Jesus never said that. And that's why uh, I wanted to take just a few minutes and encourage all of us today, um, particularly uh, moms today, since it is Mother's Day. So Jesus never said, if you follow me, life will be easy. Well, what did Jesus actually say? If he never said life would be easy, what did he say? Well, here's, a, here's several verses. I want to, want to run these uh, by you real quick. Um, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and what? What does that say? The way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So Jesus says right here, the gate that leads to life is a difficult path. It's a difficult way. And we'll talk about why that is in just a few minutes. In John chapter uh, 16 and verse 33, Jesus said this. He said, I have said these things. He was talking to his disciples that you may have, that in me you may have peace. What, is, what, is the, what do the yellow words say? In the world you will have tribulation. Has that been anybody's experience today? Like in the world you've had tribulation? Good, none of you. That's amazing. I need you to come up here and preach the message, and I'll go sit out there and listen because I'm still trying to figure this whole thing out. Right, we all know that. Like, the world is hard. There's tribulation in the world. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me back in Matthew 7, 13, and 14, he says, listen, if you're going to follow me, that's a narrow path, and that's a narrow gate, and its way is difficult, it's hard, and there's few who find it. In 2 Timothy 3.12 Jesus didn't say this, but Paul did, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Did any of you know that when you um, accepted Jesus by faith, when you stood up in a baptistry one day to be baptized, did you know that you were signing up for persecution? It probably wasn't presented exactly that way to you, right? It wouldn't, but hey, like, listen, you come follow Jesus, you'll get beat to death your whole life. I mean, people will verbally abuse you, they'll challenge you, like the devil's going to be on you. you. You didn't know that you were signing up for that, but that is actually what Jesus teaches. So here's a question. Like, if we presented the gospel that way, hey, listen, um, do 
you know Jesus? No, I don't know Jesus. Okay, then let me tell you about Jesus and what he did. He died on a cross for the forgiveness of your sins, and that if you place your faith in it, like every one of us, we're all sinners. We've fallen short of the glory of God, which means you have a debt. If In, in economical terms, which the Bible would often uh, show these, that your sin created a debt that you couldn't pay. And then Jesus, when he died on the cross, he paid the debt. Then all you have to do is accept and believe in and trust in that when Jesus died, that that sin was, your sins were fully forgiven. And then you just spend the rest of your life following him. And he will not only set you free at the moment of salvation, but he will keep you free as you, as you follow him. But what if we presented the gospel and we said, hey, now, let me, now that you are interested in be- becoming a believer in Jesus, let me tell you some other things that Jesus said. This path is going to be difficult and it's going to be hard. All who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Um, how about this one? There, were, there, were, there was a, a scene in um, Scripture where Jesus is being followed by some folks. And one guy says, hey, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, you know, the birds of the air, they have their nests. The foxes have their den. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Are you, and, and, and what he's doing is he's challenging him to go, listen, this isn't going to be a comfortable life. I mean, we're not staying at the, we're not staying at the Hampton Inn or the Marriott. We're, we're not staying at some five-star resort. We're, you're, this is going to be a difficult path. Its way is difficult, but it leads to life. Or what if we said, um, the, the, there's another guy right behind him who says, okay, Jesus, well, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus, he says, but he says, I'll follow you wherever you go, Jesus, but listen, let me go first. I need to go bury my father. And Jesus says something really difficult and hard. He says, listen, let the, let the dead bury the dead. As for you, you follow me. That's tough stuff. Or how about this one? Another guy, third guy says, Jesus, I'll go with you wherever you, I'll follow you wherever you go, but let me first go say goodbye to my family. And Jesus would say to him, he said, look, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Like, those are not coffee cup verses. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, nobody gets that, wants to buy that t-shirt and walk around with it. And so what if we presented the gospel to people that way? What if we presented the gospel to people in such a way that made them understand or allowed them to understand that following Jesus, as he said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, that if you're going to enter, if you want the way to life, you have to go through the narrow gate, travel the narrow path. And by the way, it's a difficult path. It's hard. And to, for, for most of us, I know what you're thinking because it's the same thing that I thought. Well, Jesus, who wants to do that? Like, why would anybody sign up for that? Well, let me tell you where all of this intersects. I want to share with you um, another reference from Jesus. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus would say this, Come to me, all you who what? Labor and are heavy laden. And he says this, and I will what? Give you rest. He goes on to say this, take my, let's say that word together, yoke, take my yoke upon you and what? Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find what? Rest for your souls. There it is again. He's bringing this rest into play for us. Then in verse 30, he goes on to say, for my yoke is what? And my burden is light. Now, what in the world do we make of that? I mean, Jesus says, listen, if you want to find life, you've got to enter through the narrow gate, walk the narrow path, and its way is difficult. But then he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What in the world? What Jesus is trying to teach us, first of all, he is not saying that life will be easy. He said his yoke is easy, and there is a significant difference. Jesus was saying to the people that had come up to him and had approached him and were following him. See, most of these people in the Jewish culture, as they came to Jesus, they had been under this thing called the Levitical law for for just generation after generation after generation. See, in the beginning, God gave man one commandment, don't eat from the tree in the midst of the garden. And then man sinned. And so after man sinned, they get booted from the garden. They're out of relationship with God. Eventually, through a series of, of covenants and promises from God, there would become a generation of people Um, a a nation of people known as Israel. Israel would be delivered out of slavery and they would be set free. And as they leave Egypt, 
They find themselves in the wilderness, and in the wilderness, God would take Moses up on the mountain, and he says, all right, Moses, I got you out. You're my people. It's not a condition to get in. You're already in. But in order for our relationship to be maintained, in order for our relationship to be good, and in order for you to get along with other people well, I need to give you ten commandments. And so he gives us the Ten Commandments, which basically are two tablets, which they spell out how we can be right with God and how we can be right with other people. And God knew we couldn't keep those. So he then implemented right after that, he implemented a, a, a sacrificial system that when you blow it, when you sin, when you mess up, when you break my law, when you, when you sin against other people, when you sin against me, what it's going to be required of you is for you to bring a sacrifice. He laid out exactly what the sacrifices were for the different types of sins. And then once a year, there was this thing called the Day of Atonement where they would come and they had this animal that they had raised. He had to be perfect and spotless. And they would bring him to the priest and the priest would inspect him for a period of days. And then they would, sacrifice, they would cut the animal's throat and then they would take the blood and they'd sprinkle it on the mercy seat, representing the forgiveness of sins for people and their families and the nation for the entire year. And then after another year, you had to come back. And by the way, from these Ten Commandments and from all these Levitical, there sprung 613 Levitical laws. I don't know about you, but most of the time I have a hard time remembering the Ten Commandments, much less, man, how in the world are we supposed to remember 613 laws? And so Jesus steps into this culture in the first century Jerusalem, and you have there people who have been burdened by the weight of 613 Levitical laws, having to keep up with the law daily, having to be constantly reminded every time they break one of the laws how bad they are, how wrong they are, and it was a heavy, heavy weight. And so Jesus steps in and he says, listen, all you who, are, all you who labor and are heavy laden, come to me. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. Jesus is not saying life would be easy, but what he is saying is my yoke is easy. Jesus is saying to the people, um, I didn't come to you with rules and regulations. I didn't want to add to what was already there. Actually, what I want to do is I want to bring it all back. I want to simplify life. I want, to, I want you to understand that my yoke is easy. Not that it's easy to follow me, but the yoke is easy. The burden is easy. Here's what he says. He takes all of those things. One day somebody comes to him and he says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, well, the first and greatest commandment is you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. That's the Shema. It's something that they knew and quoted in the Old Testament. He says in the second, it's just like it. That you should love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus takes all of those things. He pulls them back and he says, hey, listen. Here's two things. Love God. Love people. Love God. Love people. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And when he talked about yoking, see a yoke, many of you being from an agricultural area, we kind of understand a yoke a little bit, but what they would do is a yoke is a big wooden thing where you would take two ox and they would put them together and they would tie the ox onto it and then that's what they would use to plow the fields. But what they would do is oftentimes when there was an inexperienced ox, if there was a young one who was just coming into maturity, was strong enough to help pull, what they would do is they would take an inexperienced ox and they would yoke him together with an experienced one. And so for a while, what would happen is that inexperienced one, he would try to pull off. He would try to go his own direction. He would try to do his own thing. But what he would do over the course, they would keep him yoked together for two to three days straight. And what would happen over time is the young, inexperienced ox would eventually fall in line with the older, more experienced one. And now, instead of having a hard time fighting against, they now are able to work together to produce the plowing of the field. And Jesus is saying, listen, Take my yoke upon you. In other words, Jesus is saying, you put my yoke on. So me and you, we will be yoked together. And you're going to fight and you're going to push. But if you will stick with me, if you'll stay with me, yes, the path is difficult. 
Because there is a fight that's going to ensue. You're going to try to do your own thing. You're going to want to do your own thing. But if you will stay with me, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And there is a path that you will find yourself on that will lead to life and it will lead to rest. So what's the answer? How can a Jesus follower, how can someone who's following Jesus or how can following Jesus be both easy and difficult at the same time? Paul, um, in, in many ways, if we think about it, it's after a person comes to faith in Christ that the fight begins. See, prior to coming to faith in Christ, there really wasn't a fight. I mean, I just did whatever my flesh wanted to do. I mean, if I thought it was a good idea, I just did it. If it, you know, it's kind of like a culture teaches today. Hey, if it feels right, and here's the problem with that. When we come to faith in Christ, suddenly we know something. We know that there are things that are, are harmful for us. They're harmful to our relationship with God. They're harmful in our relationship with other people. And so we, we, all of a sudden this fight begins within us. And this, this fight, is, it's a struggle and sin heats it up. And it's not until we come to the knowledge of sinfulness and what sin is that, that the struggle really begins. So when we become believers in Christ, when we begin to follow, there's this, there's this fight that ensues. All people are born with a, a nature that's bent towards sin, which is why we don't need to teach our children how to bite, how to hit, how to scratch. I mean, if we had to teach our kids that, then who taught them that? Right? I mean, none of us did that. No one, none of us sat them down one day and said, okay, listen, all right, little Joe, like, like, look, I know you're a year old, but listen, come Sunday in the nursery, they're coming for your toys. I just want you to know that. And when they do, you just deck them or you bite them. And if you do, they'll leave your toys alone. Like we didn't teach them that, but they do it. Why? Sin nature. It's, it's the fight, right? And so um, when a person is converted, the sin nature doesn't disappear. And so the internal conflict begins to rise up within us. There's an eternal conflict. There's a struggle that begins to happen. And the Apostle Paul would have some insight on this. Listen to what Paul says. In Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, Paul says this. He says, so I find it, I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God. In other words, I just love the law of God and I know it's right and this is what I want to do and it's, I want to live my life full on for the glory of God and I want, to, I want to do things that elevate God in my life. So in my inner being, this is what, but I see, watch this, he says, but I see in my members another law. What are those two words? You ever feel the wind inside you? I do. I mean, all the time. Listen, when people are in the fast lane going lower than the speed limit, there's a war, right? When people get in the checkout, the the express checkout line, 10 items or less, and they got 11 in the buggy, you know how many you got in that buggy? There is a war raging, right? And we all deal with it. And your wars are different than my wars, but every single one of us have Wars. Parents, you ever had one of those days when your kids were just, like you're wondering if their teacher gave them Red Bull at school, and you're having one of those days where they just, they don't listen, you're stressed out, and the, and the war is raging up in you? Do you know that feeling? Amen. Thank you. There's, honesty is, is a good trait, okay? Like, like, we can be all, it's a safe place. We can just share, all right? Like, as a matter of fact, let's just go ahead. Everybody just take uh, one person at a time. Stand up and share like your meltdown moment. No takers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a war. And Paul says that I find in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Paul is saying that there is a fight going on inside of us. I don't know if um, you've ever had to fight for anything in your life. I don't know if you've ever been in a physical fight. But, um, you know, physical fights, they usually don't last long unless you're a professional because we just don't have that kind of endurance, right? 
Physical fights don't last long, but you know what fights last longer? It's the emotional fights. It's the psychological fights. It's the mental fights. that Those things can last years, and they are heavier than any physical fight that you would ever and we felt that, right? We've, you've probably been there. You've laid in bed at night. Your wheel's spinning. You can't turn it off because there is just something that is turning inside of you and your mind just can't switch it off because you've got to struggle. And it's an emotional one. It's, a, it's not a physical one. It's emotional and it is a fight. And it's exhausting. But what Paul is talking about is a spiritual fight. And the problem is that we don't know that we are in a fight. We didn't know that we were signing up to to start a fight until we began to follow Jesus. Then the law begins to show us things and then the fight and the struggle begins to happen. In the beginning, when we begin to follow Jesus, it's interesting. We have no, we can't even say no, right? Like there's a temptation that comes. There's a fight that ensues inside of us, in our heart and in our minds. And in the beginning, we have no ability or very limited ability, let me say limited ability, to say no and to fight the good fight. In, order, uh, in other words, to follow Jesus and to stay committed to the path. But as we grow stronger, as we tie ourselves to Jesus, as we put our yoke, put his yoke on us, as we do that, he instructs us, he teaches us. Suddenly, he's pulling weight that we couldn't pull. Which kind of goes back to the whole thing that, you know, the, another thing that Jesus never said that, um, that all, listen, life will, life will be easy and he'll never put more on you than you can bear. It's not true. He'll definitely let you walk through things more than you can bear so that you trust in his strength, which is, again, why we should yoke ourselves to Jesus. As we go stronger, we develop the discipline, the maturity, and the trust in Jesus to be able Fight the good fight. One of the more, more important aspects of fighting any fight is you have to know what you're fighting for. Do you know what you're fighting for today? What are you fighting for? It's an important aspect of fighting, right? You, you, you need to know what you're fighting for. For instance, if somebody comes up to me and says, hey, look, uh, I, want, I want what you're about to eat, and I'm going to fight you for it, I'd be like, dude, have it. Like, man, I'm not getting beat up over some food. Like, I, I don't want to get cuts. I don't want to get bruised. You can have my food. I'll buy you some more if you want. But if somebody comes to me and says, hey, um, look, uh, I want your kids, and I, I'm going to fight you for it. it, it it's going to be a fight, okay? It's going to be an all-out fight. And, and you, you are going to have to, you are going to have to just knock me out. And then you're going to have to make sure that I, 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 you probably need to make sure I'm dead because if you knock me out, I will wake up. And to quote somebody from a famous movie, I will find you, right? You have to know what you're fighting for. See, I'm going to fight harder for my kids than I am for a piece of food. And so will you. See, it's important to know what it is that you're fighting for. This is an important part of a fight. So I want to give you I want to give you two lies from the devil concerning your fight and what we're fighting for ultimately, right? The two lies from the devil is, number one, you're not in a fight. You're not in a fight. I don't listen to anything that preacher says. You're not in a fight. There's not a fight. Just go live your life. Do what you want. Be happy. No, you're, you're in a fight. Now, you won't know for sure that you're in a fight or you won't feel the tension of being in the fight until you begin to say, hey, look, I'm a follower of Jesus. Like, these folks did in the baptistry today, like, hey, I'm following Jesus. It's who I am. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. When you do that, the fight begins. So the first lie from the devil is that you're not in a fight. The second one is, you can't win. Why bother? See, again, if I know, if I know some, some big, big dude comes up and says, hey, man, I want your food. All right with me, man. I, you can have my food. Like, I, I know you can handle me, but that same big dude, and I don't care how big he is, he comes after my kids. I'm going to do what I can. Right? You got to know what you're fighting for. And the reality is, is the devil's going to say, you're not in a fight, or he's going to tell you, you can't win the fight. And you know what? He's probably right. You can't. But greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. 
And listen, I don't care whether or not I have the ability to win it. As long as I put my faith and trust in the strength of Jesus Christ, then Jesus is going to fight my battles. And what did we sing just a while ago? When I fight, I'll fight on my knees. It's the strongest position for any of us as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. When it comes to your family, when it comes to your spiritual life, what you need to do is you don't need to stand up and fight. When somebody comes against you, when somebody gossips about you, you don't need to jump up and fight. What you need to do is drop to your knees and you, you just sing that song to Jesus. When I fight, I'm going to fight on my knees. Because the battle belongs to you. He will. He will fight your battles. And y'all missed a good amen point, but that's okay. It's okay. It may be because somebody, maybe you need to realize that you're in a fight. I hope today you walk out of here and you realize that I am in a fight. Every single day of your life, every minute of your life, every breath you take, you are in a fight. And you, you don't have to win. Win the fight for you. You and I need to rest in that. Listen to this. Today, um, moms, you're going to get a gift. And it's going to seem like the most ridiculous gift. Like, what was he thinking picking this out? This is dumb. This isn't like feminine. This isn't a girl's gift. You're going to get a little stress reliever boxing glove. Okay? You're like, boxing glove? Like, what about flowers or something feminine? No, we're giving you a boxing glove. Okay? It's a little red boxing glove. It's a keychain. You put it on your keychain when you get stressed out and your kids are giving you one of those days, you just squeeze that thing till you can't squeeze no more. Okay? When your husband is giving you a hard time, you just keep squeezing. Okay? You can have more than one. You can have one for both hands. Kids, husband, kids, husband, kids, husband, kids, husband. I want you to have it. With this, as, as, as we began dreaming about this day and thinking about this day, we wanted to get you a boxing glove to remind you that every time you grab your keys before you leave the house, that you will be reminded that you are in a fight. But it's a fight that you don't have to win. Kids, you're going to fight for your kids. You're going to fight for your kids every single day of your life because you know who wants your kids? The enemy wants your kids. We, we stand up here and dedicate babies. The enemy wants your kids. The millennial generation, less than 20% of millennials claim to be evangelical Christians. Less than 20%. He's, he's winning the fight. So what we do is we got that glove, you go grab that glove and you go get on your knees beside your bed and you start praying for your kids. You get frustrated, you just stress release, squeeze that thing. But we wanted to give you something that would be a reminder of the fact that we are in a fight. And so when you leave today, make sure our ushers will be at the doors handing them out. Get one to start with. Make sure we got enough for everybody. I'm, I'm positive we do. I'm pretty sure there's probably enough close to for everybody to have one. But ladies, everybody grab one on the way out. And if there's some left over, you can take what you want. Maybe there's a friend you know of that needs encouragement. Maybe there's a friend that you know of that's in a fight. And you, maybe you take that keychain to him and you go, look, I want you to know that the strongest place that you'll ever be is on your knees. Let God fight your battles for you and take this keychain as your stress reliever and as your reminder. But I want you to know, moms, you are a gift from God. And we know that, as they say, the struggle is real. We know that every day that you're trying to parent, you're asking your kids to kind of take on the yoke of Jesus. You're, it's kind of like you're yoking together with your kids and sometimes you feel like the experienced one and your kids are just fighting against you and pulling against you. You stay the course. You keep fighting. One day, I promise you, your kids will look up and go, look, I know I fought you every single day of my life till I was however old they, they are. But they're going to look up one day and they're going to go, thank you for being faithful. Thank you for teaching me. Thank you for always fighting for me, even when I wasn't fighting for myself. Moms, happy Mother's Day.